Earlier this week, I, along with many others across the Unitarian Universalist Association, uh, received an email signed jointly by the Reverend Peter Morales, current president of our UUA, and the Honorable Thomas Andrews, president and CEO of the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. <clears throat> I'd like to read that email to all of you now. Dear friends of faith and conscience, we're writing with what we expect is the same urgent sense of concern you're feeling about the results of the presidential election and what will follow. Based on the many conversations we've had with each other, people of our communities, our partners, and those most likely to face looming threats, we've concluded that in these extraordinary times, we must be united in purpose to protect the values of our democracy and those vulnerable populations among us. To that end, we have undertaken an unprecedented degree of coordination between the Unitarian Universalist Association and the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. There is a great sense of urgency and a need for vigilance, and there is clarity that we must act, not alone, but together. <clears throat> we need everyone, including you, your congregation, your friends, and your colleagues. As a first step, we have prepared a declaration of conscience, stating in the strongest possible terms our commitment in these troubling times. By signing the declaration, individuals and congregations will be affirming our core values and declaring our willingness to put them into action. Please read it, and with your signature, join us in standing on the side of love, protecting the most vulnerable among us, and defending core values that are under attack. We will be vigilant of administration actions, policies, and verbal assaults that undermine the principles of our declaration or disparage, threaten, or attack innocent people. We will respond by speaking truth to power and mobilizing support for those who are under siege. To be successful, your support and that of your congregants will be critical. This is not about partisan politics. It is a principled response to the potential targeting of people, not for what they have done, but for who they are. It is a commitment to speak out and to act in support of basic human rights. We will keep you informed of the progress of this effort and of further opportunities to advance our cause together in the coming weeks and months. We cannot predict what the future will bring, and we do not pretend to have all the answers but we can and will be ready for the struggle ahead of us. If you feel the same, please join us. Join us in transforming faith into action. Sign the Declaration of Conscience today, share it with your own networks, and please encourage others to sign as well. Thank you for your concern, vigilance, and willingness to act. In faith and solidarity, the Reverend Peter Morales and the Honorable Thomas Andrews. P.S. If you serve Unitarian Universalism as a minister of a congregation, we strongly encourage you to read the declaration during this Sunday service and ask your attendees to sign it. What I'm about to read then is the text of the Declaration of Conscience. At this extraordinary time in our nation's history, we are called to affirm our profound commitment to the fundamental principles of justice, equity, and compassion to truth and core values of American society. In the face of looming threats to immigrants, Muslims, people of color, and the LGBTQ community, and the rise of hate speech, harassment, and hate crimes, we affirm our belief in the inherent worth and dignity of every person. In opposition to any steps to undermine the right of every citizen to vote, or to turn back advances in access to health care and reproductive rights, we affirm our commitment to justice and compassion in human relations. And against actions to weaken or eliminate initiatives to address the threat of climate change, change, actions that would threaten not only our country but the entire planet, we affirm our unyielding commitment to protect the interdependent web of all existence. We will oppose any and all unjust government actions to deport, register, discriminate, or despoil. As people of conscience, we declare our commitment to translate our values into action as we stand on the side of love with the most vulnerable among us. We welcome and invite all to join in this commitment for justice. The time is now. We will post a link to this Declaration of Conscience on our Facebook group page. 
Uh, we will also email the link in our next weekly e-blast so that if you are in agreement with this statement, you can sign your name and pledge your support as I myself have already done. If there's anyone who would like to sign this declaration who does not have internet access, please come to the church office immediately after service and we will assist you. We will put you on one of our office computers so that you can add your name as well. Indeed, as this email and this declaration both affirm, we find ourselves now in the midst of strange and fearful times. The future is uncertain. The anxiety is palpable. I'm not going to stand at this pulpit and insult you with cheap, facile promises in order to provide you an equally cheap and facile sense of comfort. I will not glibly declare everything is going to be okay. I'm not going to tell you it won't be as bad as you fear. I'm not going to advise you to simply retreat within for the next four years to barricade yourself behind a wall of personal happiness, inner peace, and good vibes so as to avoid sympathetically experiencing the pain and fear of those living at the margins. We must remember that if the world burns, not all of us will have the privilege to avoid the heat of those flames by simply escaping into a world of personal transcendence. Now, please do not misunderstand me. We desperately need a deep spirituality, moments of transcendence and inner peace to center us, to anchor us, to give us perspective for the very important work that is to come. And in the end, it may be the case that these next four years won't be as bad as some of us fear. And it may just be the case that in the end, everything really is going to be okay. But we cannot afford to make those assumptions now. We cannot afford to be anything less than vigilant. I must believe that right now, the only way that everything will be okay is if we come together and act to make sure that everything will be okay. Nevertheless, this morning, I am buoyed by an immense, if not somewhat irrational hope. A hope that we have both the ability and the will, not only to resist laws and policies of fear and hatred, but to affirmatively advance justice and love in 2017 and in the years to come. Where does this hope come from? Well, the marches yesterday certainly helped, but even beyond the marches, my hope springs from my Unitarian Universalist faith, and specifically in the power of our very unique understanding of love, because there ain't no love like you, you love. It's not a stretch to say that just about every major religion on earth has a doctrine or a definition or a belief, at least, in some kind of divine love. But I would argue this morning that Unitarian Universalist love deserves to be in its own category because you, you love is super big. Our understanding of love may be the most encompassing, the most inclusive, the most powerful love of any faith tradition. And it is the unique power of our love that gives me the hope that in the end, love will win. So what is it about you you love that makes it so powerful? To answer that question, we need to dig a little bit into our own history and theology, specifically the universalist side of our heritage. So in a very reductionist nutshell, which is all I have time for this morning, I can tell you that our universalist Christian forebears were unified by a common belief that in the end, every human soul, every child of God, would ultimately be redeemed. That is, every person would eventually be reconciled to God, that in the end, everyone would be saved. No one would be condemned to an eternity of separation from the divine source. Such a belief, now a heretical belief in the eyes of Orthodox Christianity, I might add, such a belief presupposes and demands a super powerful kind of divine love. See, 
Orthodox Christianity for the past two millennia has generally argued that despite the fact God loves all his children, in the end, millions and billions of human souls will be forever separated from God because of the power of hell or sin or the devil. In other words, from an Orthodox Christian perspective, God's love can be thwarted, overcome, but not so in the Universalist tradition. From the perspective of the Universalists, nothing can thwart or overcome the inexorable, all-consuming love of God. Neither hell, nor sin, nor the devil himself. God's divine love overcomes all obstacles. To bind itself forever to the target of its affection, nothing can stop it. This Christian universalist understanding of the divine love is a gift that we present day you use have been blessed to inherit. We have the honor of being the keepers and guardians and ambassadors of this massively powerful <laughs> love. But such an immense honor comes with an equally immense responsibility. Such a powerful, all-inclusive love does not have the luxury of being able to discriminate. It must be freely given to all. And this morning, I'd like to focus your attention on just three specific recipients of this great love. And I'm, I'm going to warn you, I'm going to frame this conversation by drawing upon the Christian scriptures and specifically the words of Jesus. Now, parenthetically, I'd just like to note that as Unitarian Universalists, Although we gladly accept a diversity of different sources of wisdom for our faith, we sometimes ironically have the most difficulty incorporating the wisdom from our own Christian heritage. I am as guilty of this as anyone. I grew up as an evangelical Christian, and in that context, I had, as they like to say, a personal relationship with Jesus. I actually really like that metaphor. Uh, it's one that I still find incredibly useful today. So yes, I once had an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus, and now years later, I would describe my relationship with Jesus by saying he's a lot like an ex-girlfriend. <laughs> once upon a time, we loved each other deeply. Then several years ago, we had a really bad breakup. Really bad. It took us a while, but we eventually stopped hating each other, uh, and now we're kind of cool. And you know how like uh, when you see like maybe some recent pictures of your ex on Facebook and like they look pretty good, you know, like, 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 like they look really good, like they've lost some weight, they've hit the gym, um, and then maybe you reach out and then you start messaging, you know, and uh, you know, then you think you, you go grab some coffee, but then you immediately remember why you broke up in the first place. So that's how it is kind of like with me and Jesus. Um, Sometimes I see my Christian friends talking about Jesus. I reread some of my all-time favorite Bible verses. Reminds me how hot Jesus was back in the day. I flirt with the idea of reclaiming my Christianity. But ultimately, I tend to then see the stuff that reminds me why I had to leave in the first place. That's just my experience, and so it goes. But the point is, at least I think the point is this morning, in looking at these three specific groups that I think our love should be directed toward, I'm going to be quoting from my ex-girlfriend. Uh, because I think that Jesus had some truly wonderful insight on this matter. One of the most famous quotes we have from Jesus was an answer uh, to a question, the question being, what must I do to gain eternal life? Part of Jesus' answer to that question was, love your neighbor as yourself. So let us begin there. One, love your neighbor. Love those close to you both geographically and ideologically. As you use, I believe one way we love our neighbors is by loving those who, like our heretical Christian forebears, are on the margins of the mainstream, those who live under the constant threat of persecution and oppression. As Unitarian Universalists, we ourselves a religious minority in this country, we should have a special sympathy for those at the margins. I believe we are called especially to love the impoverished, the stranger sojourning in our land, that is, immigrants, 
members of the gay and lesbian community, the bisexual community, the trans community, people of color, Muslim Americans, the impoverished and the disabled. It is our love for these people that ought to compel us to build meaningful and mutual relationships with these communities, to work together in solidarity for justice for all and for each other, which means fiercely and courageously resisting any action or speech that harms or threaten harms to them. It means directly addressing classism, ableism, racism, sexism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, homophobia, and transphobia whenever and wherever we find it, including within ourselves. Loving our neighbor also means loving those who share our progressive values. Liberals really love to critique each other. If you are a liberal and on Facebook recently, you may have recognized this fact. Um, I think it's a good trait. It's one of the reasons I like liberalism. However, in times of great duress, constructive friendly critique can also devolve into cannibalism. So I urge all of us in these difficult times to love our neighbors. Love your neighbor by, in a spirit of humbleness, being open to critique and not taking it too personally, by refusing to be reactive, by really listening and hearing, and by altering course when you've learned something new. And on the other side of it, I encourage those who do offer critique to do so in a spirit of love and grace that seeks to educate and edify while seeking to avoid unnecessary hurt or harm. As ideological neighbors, we are all in this together and we need to support each other now more than ever. For our second group to love, I go to the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus famously told his disciples, love your enemies. I want to note that during his ministry, Jesus never said, don't have enemies. He never said, truly spiritual people get along with everyone. No, Jesus presumed that his disciples would have enemies. Jesus had enemies, and he had no problem calling them out, literally turning over their tables and chasing them out of church with a whip. Standing on the side of love, means that love requires you to sometimes choose a side. And that means that you will be guaranteed to have enemies in this world. If you don't have enemies, I will ask you this question. Who are you not loving hard enough in order to avoid conflict? Jesus expected his disciples to have enemies just as he did. But here's the difference between Jesus and many other people. He said, those enemies, you love them. So per our universalist heritage, I commend you, have your enemies, but literally love the hell out of them. In the days to come, we will have to resist the words, actions, and proposed policies of those who would seek to harm those that we love. Our resistance, which will be fierce and certain, must nevertheless also be grounded in love for those whom we oppose. We must resist with compassion and honor, leaving open a pathway for redemption. This is critical. Even if we succeed in stopping campaign promises from becoming policy, we must nevertheless recognize that we still live in a nation where half of the voting population believed in the rightness of those campaign promises. Our resistance then must also strategically encompass the ability to win hearts and minds, to restore relationships that have been and will be broken, to help the lost find their way. This will require an especially hardy and resilient kind of love. A love that seeks genuine reconciliation as opposed to a false unity. A false unity is an artificial peace founded on polite silence and tacit acquiescence. The path to genuine reconciliation in this nation is not simply observing a don't ask, don't tell policy about social issues when talking in polite company. 
We must continue to have those hard conversations in which we show freely to others the beauty of our love and the necessity of justice for all. We must speak the truth, but always in love. Finally, the third group we, we love, I will uh, return again to our original Jesus quote this morning, love your neighbor as yourself. Often overlooked in these words is the fact that Jesus presumed that his disciples should love themselves. So I say this explicitly to each and every one of you this morning. In these difficult days that lie ahead, love yourself. Be kind to yourself. Be generous and forgiving to yourself. You deserve the same kind of love and kindness and grace that you show to others. You don't have to answer every incendiary Facebook post you receive. You don't need to attend every march, give to every charity, volunteer for every cause. Give yourself permission to rest. Give yourself permission to make mistakes. In this work, you are going to say the wrong words or do the wrong deeds. And when that happens, atone as best you can, forgive yourself, and then move on. You are not perfect, but you are enough. So take care of yourself because you deserve it. So, my charge to all this morning, love your neighbor, love your enemy, love yourself. Love all three passionately, indiscriminately, extravagantly, Love with a Unitarian Universalist kind of love, a love that we bear the honor and responsibility of sharing with the entire world. It is a love that is stronger than hate, that is stronger than fear, and in the end, it is a love that will prevail. May it be so, and blessed be.